Don Wildman. I'm in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, a booming metropolis that moves at a blistering pace. Today, it's the powerhouse behind one of the world's fastest growing economies. But just 32 years ago, this was war-torn Saigon, a city entrenched in a bloody civil war, caught up in an epic struggle between world superpowers. Vietnam was a poor country then, a nation divided in two. So how did an army of rice farmers and fishermen resist America's overwhelming military might? To get the answers, you have to dig deep. You have to go underground. The Vietnamese had a long legacy of fighting guerrilla wars, from the invasion of the Qin Dynasty in the second century BC to the French occupation in the early 20th century. But after the French occupation ended, Vietnam was left divided in two at the 17th parallel, the Communist North and the Democratic South. Throughout the early 60s, tension between the North and South had reached a fever pitch. Finally, in 1965, an all-out war began. The South Vietnamese and its U.S. allies had to face an enemy that was ready and waiting, the NVA, or North Vietnamese Army. But their biggest challenge was fighting the guerrilla army in the South, the VC, or Viet Cong. In 1965, American troops outnumbered the Viet Cong nearly two to one. They focused most of their military power on a 40 square mile area called the Iron Triangle. It was a hotbed of Viet Cong activity, and the Kuchi Tunnel System was the nerve center of it all. When young American troops were first dropped into the jungles of Vietnam, they had to trudge through this. It was some of the densest jungle in the world. They were constantly on the lookout for booby traps and Viet Cong fighters who seemed to appear out of nowhere. Now, they knew the enemy was operating in tunnels beneath the ground. But what they didn't know was there was a massive military complex hidden right below their feet. The Kuchi tunnel system stretched for an amazing 75 miles, coming to within 10 miles of Saigon. Much of the system was destroyed by bombs or bulldozed. But under Tung Fu Village, a large section of these tunnels remains intact. And local guide Ho Hunan knows it inside and out. And if I see entrance done. Find the entrance. This looks like an entrance right here. Can you open it? Uh-huh. Mm, that bomb explosion. That the booby trap there. This is a booby trap. Yeah, I got blown up in a bomb. Yes. Huh? So this is a, a, a decoy. So they wanted us to find this. They wanted us to yeah, open sure. this up. They wanted us to die. An elite group of allied soldiers called Tunnel Rats volunteered to infiltrate the Viet Cong's massive underground complex. It was the only way to find and kill the enemy, but it was also the deadliest job in the war. For them, these tunnels were hell. Tunnel Rats, eager to find an entrance, were often caught in deadly traps like this one. The dummy entrance door was wired to a hand grenade that exploded when the door was lifted. Another simple trick was to attach a tripwire to a box of scorpions or simply dig a pit inside the tunnel and fill it with sharpened bamboo stakes. The fall usually wasn't fatal, so the stakes were dipped in feces, practically guaranteeing a horrible death by infection. You can try it for yourself, just small area. Oh, yeah. So it's a, it's a really small hole. That's only safe for the Vietnamese, because uh -huh. it's so slim. Oh, okay, so they were small men, yeah. small soldiers, they could fit in this, whereas yeah. uh, Americans such as myself <laughs> would not fit so well. So this was in itself a kind of a protection. So it's one big uh, network down there. Yeah. 40 years ago, this would have been the last place you'd want to go, down into a tiny, twisting, hand-carved tunnel that might stretch on for miles, or suddenly dead end in a booby trap, or a bunker full of enemy soldiers. Man, Definitely like, hands huh? off. It's really dark, and it's really tight. Yeah. This is much tighter than I thought it was going to be. Now, this way, huh? yeah. now, is this typical of the size? Uh, in, in a war, it's smaller. Oh, man, it's lower than this one. What? Is this, this is a scorpion, huh? Yeah. Whew, it's really tight. I know, it's one thing if you were Viet Cong and you knew these mice, but if you came down and tried to get them, man, you'd be walking into a lion's den. <sighs> Even though their death rates were nearly 100% in the beginning, soldiers from the U.S. and Australia volunteered to be tunnel rats. 
They crawled in, armed with just a flashlight, a 38, and a knife, and would infiltrate the tunnels to gather intelligence or destroy the enemy. The fighting was simple but brutal. Hand-to-hand, -hand, close quarters combat in dark tunnels. Waiting around every corner was an ambush, a tripwire, or explosive, not to mention scorpions or snakes. There was no way to truly prepare for that kind of fighting. But when the U.S. was able to capture VC tunnels, they turned them into training courses for the tunnel rats. They set up elaborate obstacle courses, including simulated booby traps, false walls, and trip wires. Strong. Incredibly long. Look, you can see the bats. About every six feet or so, there's another bat. The tunnel rats were crawling through a maze that had been growing bit by bit for almost 20 years. The Coochie Tunnels began as a few interconnected bunkers dug during the war against the French in 1948. Over the years, they expanded out in a series of looping, crisscrossing passages with multiple routes between each section in case bombing or a cave-in destroyed a portion of any one tunnel. Basic defenses were built in. The main passages zigzagged to deflect explosions, and every hundred meters there were shallow pits full of water that absorbed fumes from tear gas grenades and smoke bombs. In some areas, the tunnels were four levels deep, 30 feet beneath the surface. Some B-52 craters all over the place. I mean, and that's only like, I don't know, 15 feet over our heads or so. These tunnels were so well constructed to actually absorb that impact. It was an enormous construction project. Workers tended the rice fields during the day and at night dug the tunnels beneath them. The average worker moved 35 cubic feet a day, about six wheelbarrow loads. But fresh earth would show up in aerial photographs, so the dirt had to be hidden in bomb craters, in rice paddies, or covered with leaves. It just takes a minute to crawl 35 feet, but to dig that same distance would take an entire day. It was tough, slow work, and the tunnels were kept as small as possible. 3.9 feet wide, 3 to 6 feet high. The size was crucial to prevent cave-ins when 50-ton tanks rumbled overhead. Every tunnel and every chamber kept their ceiling span small, smaller than the surface area of the tank treads. This way, tanks were always at least partially on solid ground. The weight was evenly distributed, and the tunnels were saved. And that was crucial to the war effort of the Viet Cong. There were three major VC headquarters hidden in Kuchi scores of bomb-making workshops, and thousands of guerrilla soldiers. Oh, look, this... Oh, this goes into a room down here, huh? What... what is this? That's the funny bunker. I can see daylight down here. Yeah, I see the jungle of Anderson's bat. So I'm shooting out of here if I was fighting. Oh, from here, you can, I can see the, uh, the enemy, and it can go on another place for shooting. Okay, yeah. So they can report a movement yeah, and so sure. forth. Viet Cong soldiers were careful to conceal the firing bunkers, oftentimes constructing fake anthills out of the dirt. But they were still at risk of being spotted by the enemy. After all, if you could see the enemy, that meant he could see you. I'd seen enough to know that life in the Kuchi tunnels during war could be hell, and I'd only seen a fraction of this place. In a war, there was monsoons and rain. This would have been mud and, and you know, things would have been living in it. Snakes, etc. Oh my God, look at that. And it looks like it bites. I don't know if this thing's gonna let me go by without biting me. I don't know how they fought a war down here, much less won it. I don't know where there's an exit, but I gotta get out of here. But no matter how well built these tunnels were, much of the fighting still happened above ground. And of the 16,000 Viet Cong troops that operated in the Kuchi tunnels, only 6,000 survived the war. This was the true history of the Vietnam War, the forgotten remnants and buried tactics of a guerrilla army that turned the tide against the largest military force on the planet. Up next, an entire village survives for six long years underground. Oh, look, I could not have told you this was here. And later, heading into the heart of the war.
It's massive. It's just huge. By October 1967, the U.S. military had built more than 40 ice cream plants in Vietnam in an effort to make the troops feel more at home. The Vietnam conflict was the first televised war in history, but the bloody images beamed into American homes didn't tell the whole story. The jungles and rice paddies we saw on TV actually concealed another battlefront, a subterranean one. During the Vietnam War, most people lived in small towns like this. But even ordinary villages could become the target of intense American bombing, and many simply vanished. But one extraordinary village just north of the DMZ found a way to survive by going underground. Just north of the DMZ, or Demilitarized Zone, the three-mile buffer zone between North and South Vietnam, is another tunnel system in the village of Binh Mok. Unlike the Kuchi tunnels in the south, this was not meant as a military base, but as a civilian bunker. A whole town carved out by the peasants themselves, beneath the earth. In Binh Mok, where the famous tunnels are, there's a local guy here who's going to show me the tunnels. Hey. Hey. My local guide, Min, who grew up in the area, tells me that by the end of the war, American bombing had yes, wiped sir. out the entire village. These are unexploded bombs. That yes, you unexploded here. bombs. Boy, this really puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Jeez. So how big is this bomb? Wow, it's very heavy, 2,000 pounds. How many bombs fell on this area, do they know? About a million tons. About a million? Drop in the whole area. A 2,000 pounder dropped by a B-52 left behind this enormous crater. And it's just one of many that litter the village. But why did this seemingly innocent fishing village come under such heavy attack? It all has to do with its strategic position on the South China Sea. 17 miles off the coast of Binh Mok was a top secret North Vietnamese garrison on Khon Ka Island. The island garrison was the key to defending the North Vietnamese coastline. They fired on warplanes and naval forces who entered their waters. The villagers of Binh Mok were the only ones from the mainland who could supply the weapons and ammo out to the island. When the U.S. found out that Binh Mok was smuggling arms to the garrison, they pummeled the area with millions of 2,000-pound bombs. Many civilians fled to the north, but 60 families stayed to support the garrison and its mission and moved their village underground. Of the 13 entrances, seven were hidden along this seaside cliff. Look, oh, cool, look at that. Ah, so this is one of the seven that come yeah, off the beach? Yeah, yeah, this is one of the other seven entrances uh, up the beach, and this is the entrance number one, okay. but it's well camouflaged in the old Yeah, it's yeah. totally, totally camouflaged. You yeah. couldn't even see this if you were looking in. This is how they would have been bringing in the supplies and the soldiers right into the village, right into the tunnel. While dodging bombs and continuing to run supplies to the NVA on Konkaw Island, ordinary citizens managed to construct a massive tunnel system by hand. It took 18 months of constant hard labor, but when they were done, they had created a one-of-a-kind subterranean community. Fresh water, I guess. The tunnels are just a mile long, but there are three levels to the system, the lowest over 80 feet beneath the surface. The depth was essential, since a direct hit from a B-52 could create a crater 15 feet deep. When the bombs fell, everyone descended to the third level, where even the strongest U.S. bombs couldn't reach. So this is how it was. This was how they dug it straight out of the earth. Yeah, you can feel the moist clay, I mean, and also how soft it is. Look at the, the material. So you can almost dig it with your own fingers. It's just mud, but dense, really dense. So it's not coming down. In fact, the dense clay was the key to keeping these tunnels from collapsing with 80 feet of earth pressing down on them. It was soft enough to dig, but when exposed to the air, hardened and made the perfect structural support. But that doesn't mean it was an easy project. Using picks, shovels, and hoes, they carved out 6,000 cubic feet of rock and earth, enough to fill 653 standard commercial dump trucks, and hauled it away in bamboo baskets under cover of darkness. In addition to creating two main corridors, the locals carved out kitchens, sleeping quarters, 
a hospital, everything they once had above ground. There were even 17 babies born down here. Look down here, look at that. The way they've got a gutter system for drainage, just to send the water back out. You know, they were dealing with not only the bombs, but also monsoons and everything else that a normal village would have. By the time it was finished, there were 400 people living in the Vinmok tunnels, crammed together in impossibly tight spaces. And they stayed down here for six long years. We are still in second level. Okay, so we have, we've come down two levels to this place. How far below the ground are we here? Oh, this is the second level, 15 meters underground, okay. about... Uh, 45 feet 45 or 45 so. feet. But it goes down deeper. Down yeah, 23 here. meters deep to the here, third huh? level. Can you imagine growing up down here? I mean, there were kids, there were 17 kids who were born in these tunnels. And so for the first decade of their life, they're living in these rooms, watching their movies and singing their songs in this room, and going down the hallway to their cave where their family lived. It's a hell of a childhood, huh? The villagers who lived in these rooms just 40 years ago weren't just hiding in the dark, waiting out the war. Fishermen made daring nighttime runs to the island military base, dodging U.S. patrol choppers. Like the American tunnel rats, these men volunteered for a mission they knew would likely kill them, and they were known as the Suicide Squad. In fact, many of them died at sea, but if they made it back to Vin Mok, they would be safe in these tunnels. With supplies constantly moving in and out, these dark, slippery passages were a beehive of activity, so they worked out a system to prevent traffic jams. I mean, what were these small spaces used for? Are you doing uh, passing by, passing, passing by? Okay, so it was a traffic flow, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because there'd be so many people going back and yes. forth. Yeah. You'd have to have a place to say, yeah, exactly. pass on by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Practical. Because Vin Mok was in the heart of enemy territory, a land invasion by U.S. forces was way too risky. So instead, they dropped millions of tons of bombs from above. So how could they tell between the enemy and the local? They have their own sweet mouth like this. Oh, so they identify. communicated with each other through yeah. their own, I'm okay, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't hurt me. I don't know how you wouldn't get lost down here if you didn't know where you were going. I had come in one entrance, gone through multiple levels of tunnels and bunkers, and come back out again. It was a confusing maze, and that was the point. Outsiders could never find their way through here. Oh, fresh air. <coughs> so we entered 80 feet at the bottom of this yeah. hill, of the beach. Mm -hmm. The tunnel wound its way all underneath the mountain place yes. and delivers up, us up here, right back in the village. For six years, in spite of bombing, overcrowding, and vermin, the village of Inmok found a way to hang on. Not one life was lost. When the war ended in 1975, the rebuilding began, directly on top of the tunnels that kept this town alive. Up next, a top-secret military nerve center hidden inside a massive cave. This is a whole military base, a whole operation underground, right? That's right, yeah. And later, inside the DMZ, every bunker is a bloody battleground. This is really, this is the part of the war you don't really get to see. The Ho Chi Minh Trail is a concept, not a road. The vast network spreads across hundreds of miles of terrain in both Vietnam and Laos. fighting on their home turf. They knew the terrain. They constructed a complex systems of tunnels underground for field ops and bomb shelters. They took advantage of the thick jungle canopy to conceal their supply routes north to south. And in the mountains, they used a naturally formed cave system as a top secret underground military base. The Phong Nha area is located in the Kebang Mountains. It's a two hour drive from Wei City over steep mountains of thick jungle. I took a riverboat along the Son River to meet up with a former South Vietnamese soldier named Sonny. This is the Son River in the Phong Nha area of North Vietnam. We're, we're above the DMZ, 
above the 17th parallel. This is where the war was being fought, on their home turf. I mean, they could fight from jungles, they could fight from tunnels, and they could fight from caves. And that's what this area is famous for. Sonny was a Southern Army officer who had fought alongside Americans and knew this country and its secrets like the back of his hand. Concealed beneath one of these peaks is an impenetrable top secret fortress. And rain or no rain, the only way to get there was by boat. So what do we do? We take a boat up there? Yeah, we got to take a boat there. Sorry if it rains so heavy. That's all right. We got to go anyway. The monsoon never hurt anybody. The Song River bisects the country, but most of it is actually underground. And these few exposed miles were key to the war effort, because here it flows alongside the most critical supply route in the country, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Without the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a hidden network of footpaths, roads, and tunnels, the NVA could never have moved men and supplies into southern-held territory without detection. But there was one flaw. NVA troop caravans heading south had to leave the safety of the hidden trail and cross the Son River, making it a favorite target for the U.S. and its allies, drawing down as much as 18,000 pounds of munitions a day. So this was the real hotbed of, of the war, this right, region right, of the country right, right, right here. Right. Over here, you can see the uh, the hero and the, and the uh, jungle. After that, that, that belongs to the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. The slow-moving ferries used to shuttle men and cargo across the river were easy targets for U.S. aircraft. So the NVA got smart. The ferries crossed by night, and by day, they docked out of sight in the safest harbor in the country, deep in the Phong Nha Caves. This underground lair was more than a boat dock. Like a medieval castle, it was a town, a fortress, and a dungeon. So this is the, the natural opening of the cave. That's exactly. Not, not created to look this way. No, no created at all. It's massive. And all of a sudden, totally quiet. There are over 300 caves riddling these mountains, but Feng Ya is the biggest and most impressive system. 14 chambers, some over 100 feet high, connected by a 12-mile underground river, the longest in the world. During the war, this cave acted like a natural military base. There was a harbor, a massive meeting room, a hospital, and a prison. And the subterranean section of the Son River served as a highway between it all. The tunnels of Kuchi and Vin Mok were hand-carved, but Mother Nature gets all the credit for this place. What is this? The people in this area knew these caves well. This is insane. It's huge. And knew how to use them to their best advantage during wartime. What is this up here? During the war of the year, the NVA used us as the meeting room. The high rank in the NVA uh -huh. get together over here for the meeting uh, before they making any decision mm -hmm. to so move or to hide or to fight or cease fire. So this was a, a hugely strategic area that we're, we're in, this cave system. The U.S. knew these caves were here and knew they were sheltering NVA boats, men, and supplies. But there was nothing they could do about it. The Kabong Mountains were an impenetrable bomb shelter. How big do you think this mountain is over our head here? What well, people said, it's just 200 meters high. So, 200 meters, so it's 600 feet of, of rock that's is right, over our head. That's right. That's and then this right. is about 100 feet high here. So yeah, and then total. A total protection of about 700 seven, feet of seven, rock. Right. Very good place to hide. <laughs> a <laughs> super bunker, if you want. A super bunker, if you want to say that. Added security came from the fact that this river is the only way in or out of the cave system. There was no chance of a sneak attack from the rear, since large sections of the river beyond these caves are impassable. When you consider that they knew the land that the Americans couldn't possibly know, that they knew where the jungles could hide them and where the tunnels were, but they also knew where these caves were, that nobody could possibly figure out. I mean, they're not on the map. They're just a mountain on the map. So you're flying over with a bomber, and you can't see this, but it's massive. And you could hide in here, and no one would ever find you. Or if they tried, they're not getting past the entrance. 40 years ago, this would have been full of soldiers, resting after a long march down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, preparing to go into battle. In the South, high-ranking Allied officers built bases with air-conditioned offices and swimming pools. But the North Vietnamese generals met here. Like with all their natural resources, they squeezed every ounce of usefulness out of them. So... We're under a whole mountain here, mm -hmm. and they're bombing outside that 
entranceway. It's the daytime, so all the ferries, all right. the boats are boats inside, inside, safe. The prisoners are up here. The wounded are being taken care of. The commanding officers are down here making decisions. This is a whole military base, a whole operation underground, right? That's right, yeah. Thousands of NVA soldiers could have passed through here. And because hundreds of pilots were shot down in this area during the war, it's possible that POWs passed through here as well. Americans at home watched the war on TV, but the battlefields they saw barely scratched the surface. Up next, the lost bunker in the heart of the DMZ. These would have been stations for each soldier as they were positioned like this, shooting down all around. And later, you can imagine, I mean, this is like a mini Pentagon. And the further we get to the 70s, the more desperate things have become. The South Vietnamese White House goes underground. Vietnam is only 25 miles wide at its narrowest point, more than half as narrow as New Jersey. During the Vietnam War, just about every inch of the country was a military target, from big cities to small villages, even remote mountain caves. But of all the bombed and burned out places, there was nothing quite as deadly as the borderline, the DMZ. This bridge spans the Ben Hai River at the 17th parallel. It marks the center point of what was the DMZ, or demilitarized zone. This whole region was designed as a peaceful buffer between North and South. But for nearly a decade, it was hell on Earth. It was nearly bombed into oblivion. It was riddled with millions of landmines, countless bunkers, and miles of trenches. It was essentially a no man's land. And to this day, evidence of its dark past is still buried underground. Despite its name, the DMZ became one of the most militarized areas in the world. And it was pounded with some of the heaviest bombing of the entire 14-year war. There are hundreds of bunkers, trenches, and trails that still surround the region. But since many of them have been filled in, covered up, or swallowed by the jungle, they're nearly impossible to find. I met up again with Sonny in Way City. And you got some bikes for us, huh? Yeah, you gotta put this on, please. Okay, thank yeah. you. Way is a strategic city just south of the DMZ. Some of the war's fiercest battles were fought to control it. Okay, let's go. Route 1 bisects the DMZ and is the only road that leads all the way from Hanoi to Saigon. And Way City was dead in the middle between the two. When the North Vietnamese attacked, they came right down this, this highway, this way, right? right? Right, right. Hundreds of underground bunkers protected all routes leading into the city. If the North wanted to infiltrate the South, they needed to take this highway. And to do that, they had to fight one bunker at a time. Cruising along the highway, it's hard to see the old bunkers. But from Sonny's years of military experience during the war, he's able to spot one. Sonny, this is the, the bunker right here, yeah? Right. These bunkers are just are all defending route one all the way route one the railway uh -huh. the river of uh, the waterway sure it's a whole nother river but yeah that's... you can really see the i mean this would have been a canopy okay. concealment wouldn't it you wouldn't right. even know this was here now look at the the firing holes i look we can go inside This is a, just the first level, and then there's two right, others right. above. The, uh, oh, yeah, you can get all up there, second and a third level. This is really, this is the part of the war you don't really get to see. Mm. Oh, yeah, you can really see the whole operation up here. Look how every, you know, 20 degrees or so, you can see another part of the battlefield. And the thing is, you know, this there's a village right here. This is what this was protecting, this bridge and the village. There was a lot of combat right here. Look at this. You know, the bunker's still here 40 years later. 
it survived a lot of mortar, a lot of bombing, and you can see why. Look at this rebar. The whole thing is just laced with rebar, and it creates a web of steel, steel and concrete. I mean, no wonder it's still here. This bunker is made of three levels. The first level is the largest, with firing holes facing the river, the bridge, and the road. The second and third levels were lookout posts, where soldiers would scout enemy positions. These bunkers withstood lots of deadly bombings. Like those used in World War II, they were made with rebar-reinforced concrete, making them 20 times stronger than an ordinary concrete structure. Forty years ago, these bunkers would have been filled with U.S. and South Vietnamese soldiers, ducking NVA artillery. So you... When Sonny was an infantry soldier, he would have had a front row seat to the chaos that surrounded them. These soldiers stay here, have missing that uh, to protect the, uh, the bridge here, the roads, and also the waterway. Most of the time, the soldiers stationed here remained outside the bunker until they came under heavy bombardment. So you see the uh, firing holes over here? That's one, one guy at the far one place. Okay, so there's a, there's a soldier that, that posted approved. at each one of right, these right. openings. And this bar is to hold the uh, machine gun. Okay. The stations were set up so Southern Army soldiers could look out for covert groups of Viet Cong, guerrilla soldiers that infiltrated the South. But visibility was poor from here, so only in heavy fire were the soldiers supposed to duck inside. So it's like a, a heavy attack. And uh, modern? Yeah. Long ran artillery for North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. so we gotta go this. Okay. What was it like for the soldiers when they were fighting inside here? It hurt the people inside here because exactly it blows the eyes, their ears off. Right. So that you could the building might withstand it, but mm -hmm. the shock wave coming in right, right. would still hurt and maybe kill mm -hmm. the people inside. These bunkers were made to protect the soldiers from the shrapnel of a North Vietnamese RPG or rocket propelled grenade, which would fly in at 650 miles per hour. But the biggest problem was the shock waves sound waves that penetrated through the firing holes. If an RPG landed within three feet of the bunker, it would explode with a force of 158 decibels. Human eardrums can rupture at 150 decibels, so the pressure of the bomb often caused soldiers' ears to literally rupture and bleed. Many American soldiers went home with post-traumatic stress disorder, hearing loss, or even major brain damage. But there was no way around it. In order to see and fire at the enemy, soldiers had to risk their hearing, and sometimes their lives. Look at this. These ones, they're all, they've all got their insignia. I mean, these would have been stations for each soldier. They were positioned like this, shooting down all around. When the Viet Cong came over the 17th parallel on their way down south, they were winning these skirmishes, these battles to take over forts like this, little bunkers. And that's how they took the country, one bunker at a time. Up next, inside the seat of power and the underground link to the Pentagon. I mean, they were out in the jungles, but the nerve center was right here. Vietnam is the second largest exporter of coffee in the world. This is Ho Chi Minh City, but in April 1975, it was still Saigon and still the capital of South Vietnam, but just barely. The South and its U.S. allies had been worn down by a decade of fighting an invisible, relentless army, and the end was in sight. For 10 years, the nerve center for the South Vietnamese and American forces was in a top-secret, ultra-modern bunker deep beneath the presidential palace. Five stories high, this compound covers a whole city block, it took three years to build, and during the Vietnam War, this was the safest place in Saigon for the president himself to hide. It was the White House and the Pentagon all rolled into one. Hello, Zong. Hi. Nice to meet you. Today. Thanks, you too. Yes. So this is uh, the Vietnamese White House. It's the South Vietnamese White House. During the Vietnamese War, calls were made inside these walls that sent thousands to their deaths. This room is the Russian office. This is the actual, this is the Oval Office of, yes. of the Vietnamese yeah. president. But this was war, and this room was far too exposed. At the first sign of danger, the president and his men headed down a secret staircase into an eerie parallel underworld, 
and the real nexus of power during wartime. We were the first Western TV crew since the Vietnam War to gain access to the secret rooms beneath the presidential palace. Just beneath the surface, South Vietnamese leaders were safe from bullets, shrapnel, and hand grenades, and they could concentrate on the business of running a war. Oh, I see, so there's all these little rooms. Why is that a booking address? So this is filled with, with personnel who are on the phones, manning the, the whole battle. Yes, uh, right from here, they could communicate uh, with the uh, Allied forces mm -hmm. and general in of here. Throughout the 60s and 70s, this room would have been buzzing. And on the other end of these primitive phones were American soldiers helping the South rid their country of communism. But even more amazing is that in these rooms just beneath the streets of a busy metropolis, a war was planned and run without spy satellites, computers, or cell phones. So this is actually just yes. for passing messages in and out. Yes, for the, the document. Is yeah, a, it's very basic, very basic, basic messaging yes. technology. Yes. And look, uh, See, this was when a telephone was a telephone. Yes. General Electric, so yes. all this equipment is American-made. Yes, uh, supported by the United States. Uh-huh, because it's communicating with the Pentagon back home. This is all American equipment. Look at this over here. This is like all what was left behind when the war was being fought. I mean, they were out in the jungles, but the nerve center is right here. Oh, it just sprawls out in every direction, doesn't it? You can imagine, I mean, this is like... <laughs> A mini Pentagon. It's a bunker down here. And they're fighting a whole war from here. And, and the further we get to the 70s, the more desperate things have become. And this is really where the last stand was made, in these hallways down below the palace. Peasants of Vinh Mok and Kuchi had sought shelter underground, and so did the president of South Vietnam. He even slept down here when the threat level was high. Something happened underground, he got out the bomb shelter. Yeah, okay. But it's not comfortable. It's not very uh, cozy, huh? Very spartan. What is this stairway here? Oh, it's the stairway for the, for the bodyguards in, on the second level basement. The bodyguards, the bodyguards. presidential security is down yes. there. The president's secret bomb shelter was 30 feet below the surface on the second floor of the bunker. If there was a direct attack on the palace and no time to evacuate, this is where the president would make his last stand. When there was no immediate danger, the war would be run from the war rooms above on the first floor of the bunker. And this entire subterranean structure was protected with steel plates against direct hits from bombs. But in the end, none of this was enough to stop the North Vietnamese. Sung led me from the basement to the roof of the palace, the best seat in the house to witness the end of an era. Talk about viewing here. There's a viewing. You can get really good perspective here. Huh? Yes. This is the famous gate. In the morning, I bought 1395. Mm -hmm. Uh, where the first two times of uh, labor forces came to the front gates and occupied this building. I've seen the picture, so there's like a long line of tanks down that, yes. that road. It was the spring of 1975. The U.S. had signed a ceasefire treaty with North Vietnam, and the American ground troops were gone. South Vietnamese President Thu vowed to keep fighting, but as NVA forces converged on Saigon, he fled the country. On April 29th, thousands of panicked civilians scrambled to escape the city, desperately trying to fight their way onto a handful of U.S. evacuation helicopters. On April 30th, North Vietnamese tanks entered the city and headed right here for the presidential palace. The conflict had dragged on for 14 long years, and then it was over, so quickly that all this equipment was left behind, mute reminders to a war. Independence Hall was renamed Reunification Palace under the new government of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. And all of this, the basement fortress, the tunnels, the trenches, the caves, bear witness to the painful birth